This morning, we're going to talk about uh, success in the Christian life. And uh, we've just concluded eight, an eight-part series with uh, an introduction and seven, seven habits that you can implement in your life to be a happy Christian. And uh, this morning, I, I thought it would be good to follow up with a final conclusion, success in the Christian life. I think we need to talk about success. What does that mean? What does that look like? Now, I'm not going to be giving you a lot of verses this morning. I have not gone apostate. Okay? This is one of those preachers who, who never gives me any Bible verses. Oh, calm down. I give you plenty. There's a whole Bible here you can read on your own. Okay? Sometimes I think it's, it's as important, more important, to understand the verses we read than just to read verses we don't understand. We have to be able to understand these things. Okay? So you've got a whole Bible you can read. So... We're going to talk about verses, we'll get to them, but I think we need to give you an introduction here and talk about what success is, because success is different to different people. If you talk to a businessman, success to them is uh, is dollar signs to it, right? That's success to a businessman. They they want to see money, they want to see they want to see profit, they want to see revenue. If you talk to a a, a salesman, uh, they they have a different metric. They work in terms of clients. You have to have clients. You got to have success for a salesman is clients. Success for a teacher is students, right? If I was to teach two students, there would be this much success as a teacher, but if I teach 30, there's more success. At least that's the way they equate it. Now, pastoring, pastoring is a little different. Pastoring is, uh, to some people, numbers is what it's all about. Uh, And I just have to say this, unfortunately. You cannot base success, I cannot base success on the sheer volume of people. It's just a, it's an improper metric. There are, there are a lot of churches that have a, have a lot of people, but they have no depth. They're, they're, they're a mile wide and an inch deep. And then you have some churches that are a mile deep and an inch wide, and ironically, it's the same volume. And so the goal is to grow proportionately. To, to, to grow proportionally, wider and deeper, wider and deeper, wider and deeper. You want more volume, not just people. Now, people is a way that we, 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 we gauge our success. But if I had a big old building with no people in it, is that success? If I had a lot of, if I had a lot of souls saved but no discipleship going on, let me ask you that, is that success? So we have to figure out what success looks like in the Christian life. And and I tell you what, the Christian life is similar when we look at success. Because great Bible training but poor child training is not success. A happy job but not a happy home, that's not success either. An applied finances but no applied truth, that's not success either. So when we talk about success in the Christian life, what are we going for? We need to figure out what this looks like. We need to figure out what, what to aim at. We need to figure out what we're going to what we're going to shoot for, right? We have to have a target in mind with regards to success. And, and, and I think so oftentimes we don't know what success looks like, so we end up driving right by when we see it. We don't even realize what success is, so. So we're just, there we are, just trucking along in our, in our, our daily lives, and, and there are people over here that are doing this thing, and it's, and it's called church, and we might think it's success, but there's no real success. And then we see somebody over here that maybe isn't going to church, but has a real deep, rich relationship with God, and we say, well, that's not success, they need to be in church. And so success is a funny thing. But we need to know what the end game is, don't we? What's the result? As we apply habits in our life to make us happy, as we, as we divide rightly the Word of God, what's the end game look like? Where are we going with this? I, I remember, and the details are important, by the way. The details are important. And, and, and uh, you know, the devil's always in the details, right? Like, as soon as you start to give the details, then it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I remember when I was a kid, I was 14 years old. And uh, I started doing landscaping. I was in Minnesota. I was one of these really ambitious kids. And, uh, 
by the time I was uh, by the time I was 16, I was running an eight to 15 person crew of guys, little 16 year old punk kid, right? But I remember when I was 14, man, they were breaking me in. They were breaking me in. I was there was these. Uh, you guys know what edging is, right? Landscape edging. It's like this little plastic garbage that they divide the rock from the dirt. And I remember they, they, I, you have to pull this big trenching machine, and I was pulling it. I was pulling it, and I was pulling it, and of course, it's not perfect, and, and so they're dropping the edging in and trying to stake it down, and, and of course, it's all crooked. So now these guys, these, the, you know, the crew, these guys are 20, 30 years old, and they say, and they say Joey, go grab the edging straightener. Okay, okay, okay where, where, where's it at? He says, it's in the trailer. Okay, so I run to the trailer, and I'm looking all around for this edging straightener, and I'm looking all around, and I don't want to disappoint. So I'm looking all around. I'm, I'm frantic. I'm like, I'm going to find this thing. So I... I desperation, I run back to the guys and, and I say, I'm sorry, I was, uh, and they said, where is it? And I said, well, it's, uh, I, I'm just, if they said, well, it's, it's in the trailer, it's, it's hanging up. Okay, so I run back and now I'm looking at just the things that are hanging up and there's a, it's a trailer. It's a supply, there's stuff hanging up everywhere. So there it is, I'm looking, I can't find it. And I run back to the guys and, and I say, Wally, I say, I, I can't, I can't find it. And he says, Joe, it's got a metal bent thing on the bottom, just go get it. Okay, so then I run back to the trailer, and, and I'm looking, and it's a landscape trailer. I mean, there's sledgehammers, and there's, there's crowbars, and, and there's picks, and, and axes, and all this stuff, and shelves. Everything's metal, and it's all bent. So I'm running back over there to the guys, and I'm saying, I'm really sorry, and, and I, can't, I just can't seem to find it. Joe, it's got an orange handle on it. I thought about it for a minute. I said, everything's got an orange handle on it. And so I say, you just got to go back and find it. So I'm not as ambitious, but I'm kind of, you know, there, so for some reason, there's some ambiguity going on here, right? Like, there's a reason why. After a while, I come back, I said, it's not in there, is it? <laughs> I said, Joe, there's no such thing as an edging straightener. We have to understand the details. Because if we don't get the details, we'll miss the destination. We got to know what success looks like. What are we aiming for? What are we what are we shooting for? For the Christian, for the Christian success is all about abiding. It's about abiding in Christ. It's about abiding in Christ. One commentator he said this. He said that the Christian is to bear fruit and not to bear fruit is what? Is a sad failure. For the Christian, it's bearing fruit. And not to bear fruit is a sad failure. Friends, if you go out and you buy a fruit tree, and you plant that fruit tree in your yard, and that thing doesn't bear fruit, it's failed. But generally what you do is you cut that baby down. You throw it out and you get a new fruit tree. And you make sure you follow the instructions for you guys. You make sure you follow the instructions. And you women, you tell the man, Follow the instructions. Spiritual success is about a relationship. It's about abiding in Christ. If you have not abided in Christ, you'll never produce fruit in your life. So let's look at a couple things real quick. John 15, 4. Abide, he says this, in me. And I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. Abide in me. That's the goal in the Christian life. And as you abide, here's the, here, here's, here's the illustration. Ready for this? Let me just give it to you. The only way for there to be fruit is for the branch here to abide in this. This is the vine. And if you ever look at a, look at a, 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 a vine tree, a, a branch, or a vine uh, uh, grapes and things like that. You've got this one stem that comes up, and that uh, and that is that is uh, that is 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 known as the vine. And then you at the and then it branches off. It comes off of that, and then it drops the fruit down. For there to be fruit hanging here, the branch has to be tapped into the vine. If you want success in your life, in your Christian life, if you want fruit, abundant fruit, hanging from the branch, the branch has to get its nutrients from the vine. 
And if that branch is not hanging from the vine, if it is cut off, it's not going to bear fruit. Therefore, no success. Success for the Christian is when the branch is tapped into this vine. Now, we can talk about simple habits for a happy Christian. We can talk about habits that will help you in your Christian life. Forever. We can talk about it all year long. We can talk about it. We can talk about it Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Friday night, Thursday night, Tuesday night, Monday night. We can talk about it every night of the week. We can talk about it all the time. But if you are still trying to gain your strength and produce fruit on your own, it's still only part of life's possessions. You are doing that in your own strength. Abiding in the vine is the only time that success can actually happen. If not, will still produce nothing. Look at what Luke says about this. Luke 12, 15. It says, and he said unto them, take heed and beware of covetousness. That means be careful. It's a warning. Be careful. Beware of covetousness. That's wanting what other people have. That's, that's wanting what they have, other people. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things which he possesseth. Your life does not consist in what you have and what you have not. All the simple habits. The last eight weeks of what we talked about will mean zilch. It will only produce frustration in your life. And it will never amount to success if you are not abiding in the vine. If you are trying to do all of these habits under your own strength, in your own strength, you will never produce anything except frustration. You see, because spirituality isn't about rules, it's about a relationship. It's not about the set of do's and don'ts. Now listen, I believe in the do's and the don'ts, okay? I think there's some things we should do and some things we shouldn't do, right? There's some things we should do and some things we shouldn't do. But just doing that doesn't bring fruit. Fruit only happens when the branch is tapped into the vine, getting its nutrients from it, which is Christ, by the way. Now, we've all done things in our own strength. Everybody's done things in their own strength, and they've got nothing out of it. You notice that that it's when God steps in the picture that something of substance actually happens. When God moves and, he's, and, and, and He does something for you, because you're only limited by you, you realize that. If the branch isn't tapped into this vine, if it's not tapped in, if it's dead on the ground, if it's just laying there on the ground like this branch just fell off, all the fruit it wants to produce is going to be nothing. So everything we do in our Christian life, it shouldn't be about rules. The rules will just happen as the relationship begins to form. No, nobody has to tell me that I can't go out with other women. Because I have a relationship with my wife. And you know what that means? That the rule just kind of almost goes away because of the relationship is so strong. The fruit is produced because of a strong relationship I have with someone else. I think a lot of churches, they enter into this legalistic thing. They become very, very, very legalistic and they start to formulate all of these, these rules, these do's and these don'ts. I think it just kind of happens. I think, it's, I, think it's, I think it's helpful to have guidelines and boundaries, absolutely. Absolutely. But let me tell you, when I have a right relationship with God, the, the, the rules almost kind of go away. I don't serve God because God says, serve me. I serve God because I have a relationship with Him and I love Him and I want to serve Him. Therein, it's fulfilled. The rule is fulfilled because of, the, of a strong relationship. This word, this word abide, it means to remain, it means to dwell and continue. For you to be successful, you have to continue 
in the one that makes success possible. You have to continue. That means consistency. Consistently being tied in to the vine. That's the only way that you're going to produce fruit in your life. Fruit that's last. Eternal fruit. Let me just say this too. Because we talk about fruit in the Christian life. We talk about fruit. Now, there's two kinds of fruits. There's the fruit of the Spirit. I mentioned this. I don't know if it was on Wednesday night or some, some night. I don't remember when it was. But there's the, there's the fruit of the Spirit found in Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 22. But then there's the fruit of a Christian. And that comes up in, uh, in Proverbs 11. It says that the fruit of the righteous is the tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. So there's two kinds of fruits. There's the fruit that the Spirit produces in the believer's life. And then there's the fruit that a Christian produces, which is other Christians. If you want to know if God's working in your life, don't just look at the fruit that the Holy Spirit produces in your life, but ask yourself this question. Are you, are you producing other Christians? Are you out there talking to people about Christ? Because the fruit of the righteous is the tree of life. The tree of life is salvation brought in other men. And I think this could really be both of them. I think that as you abide in the vine, as you abide in the vine, as the branch abides in the vine, and that fruit that's produced could be the fruit of the Spirit or it could be the fruit of other Christians. But you're not going to have any of that if you're trying to do everything by your own strength. And we have to do this thing consistency, or consistently, with consistency. We have to do this thing continually. It has to be something that we do and that we continue to do repeatedly. You know, this takes a lot of pressure off of us, doesn't it? It takes a lot of pressure off of me because I don't have to try to produce fruit because the fruit's not up to me. I have one job, abide in the vine. God produces the fruit from that. People say, oh, I just am struggling, just struggling with all of this stuff in my life and I'm just a burden. Are you biding in the vine? Oh, I just have struggle reading my Bible. I just can't do it. Pastor Joe, I can't do it. can't read my Bible. God help my soul. I can't read it. It's King James. Can't understand it. Too many of these in the house. It's too big. I mean, look at the size of this thing. It's huge. I can't do it. I have to ask the question. No kidding you're struggling. No kidding we have all this pressure. We're trying to produce something under our own, with, with, with all by ourselves. We are trying to, trying to uh, produce fruit the unconventional way. It's a synthetic fruit. Looks like a bowl of fruit sitting on your grandma's table. Doesn't it? Looks all fake and looks real, actually. It looks it's better than real fruit. The way they treat it with chemicals nowadays, it looks all the same, but nonetheless, anyway, on with the message. Friends, you can't do this on your own. I can't do it on my own. If I obeyed every single law in the entire Bible, I'm still not going to produce fruit if I'm doing it under my own strength. I have to ask myself this question. Am I doing this the way that God wants me to do it? Am I abiding in the vine? Am I tapped in? The vine is where you get your nutrients from, man. The, the vine is where you get your strength from. If you stay tapped into the one that's going to help you produce fruit, you're going to produce a lot of fruit. Here's an application. If you want fruit, stay close to the farmer. He'll give you all the fruit you'll ever desire. The further we get away from God and the more that it becomes a set of rules and not a relationship, the harder it's going to be to have any success in your life. And you'll continually fail over and over, and there's nothing worse than that. Just failing over and over and over and over again. And you just look around, you're like, man, I just I can't, can't get it right. Are you abiding in the vine?
Christians are to have an abundant life, but Christians are also to have an abundant life without limit. Verse 5, John 15, 5 says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. Much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Success or fruit that flows from a Christian that abides is, is unquantifiable. It's so much fruit. You can look like a grocery store. You can have so much fruit. You're, you're going you're to have more fruit than you know what to do with. Because you're, you are abiding in the vine. Now listen, I, I, like, I like fruit. How many of you all like fruit? Raise your hand. I could eat fruit. Okay, let me ask you this. How many of you don't like fruit? How many of you actually just, just not like fruit at all? That's easier, right? There's some people who didn't raise hands, but that's okay. I'm going to take your word. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm just going to take it for granted that, that you all like fruit. I could eat grapes by the, by the bundle. I could eat several bananas a day. I could eat apples. I could eat, hand, I could eat a bag of those clementines, those little cuties. Those were named after me. I could eat a bag of those things. And, uh, but we don't, we don't buy a lot of fruit in our house. If you open our, if you open our fridge, you don't, you don't see a lot of fruit, probably because we consume it all. But, um, but I think that probably most of us oftentimes suffer from not having fruit. Now, this isn't my wife's fault. We don't, we don't go to, the, if we go to the store, we buy a lot of food. I eat a lot of food, as you can tell. I think, friends, we, we don't have fruit in our life because we're not tapped into the vine. Now, this is interesting. Look in 15.5, John 15.5. Very last, very last sentence there. For without me, you can do nothing. I don't know what that means to you, but I'll tell you what it means to me. Several years ago, we lost power in our house. Now, you lose power in your house, you can't hardly do anything. You are paralyzed. Okay? And I mean this. You can, you can maybe boil water on the stove if you don't have an electric stove. If you have a gas stove, you're okay, as long as you have a match to light the stove because you've got an electric igniter. And you can fill up the water pot as long as you're not on a well. But you're on a well, then you can't get the water because you can't boil it. I mean, you're just stuck, aren't you? And then you walk around the house. You walk around your house and you, you walk in. The, the power is out in the house. It's out in the house. And you walk around the corner, you try to flip on the light. You're like, oh, the door is open. And so then you pull out your phone, and that's only good for a little while because as soon as that dies, you can't charge that because that takes electricity too. It's, honestly, it's like the power company knows that. For without me, you can do nothing. And they have you over a barrel. And that's how it is with God, by the way. We can't do anything without him. If he is truly the source of all of our strength and the production of all of our fruit happens because the branch is tied into the vine, then without him, we can't do anything. But you try to obey some rules, try to obey some rules. You can't obey the rules. Don't think that you can. How many of you sped on the way to church this morning? Don't answer that. You can't obey the rules. And you all know you can't obey the rules. We struggle with this because we tried to do it by ourselves in our own flesh. And that's a lot of pressure, brother. I tell you, that's a, I used to sit there and that's a, that's a lot of pressure. You know what? I just say this. I say, Tap into the vine. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength, everything that is within you. You love God and you abide in the vine and you know what? The fruit will happen because that is where the fruit is produced from. Everything else is artificial. Everything else is artificial. You obey all of the things, all of the external habits, all of the internal habits. You can pursue wisdom in your own power and you'll produce zero. You can prioritize meditation in your life and you'll produce zero. You can persevere in prayer and you can practice memorization and you can participate in fellowship 
You can do all of the things we've talked about the last, the last seven, eight weeks. And if you do it under your own strength, you'll get nothing. Zero in return. The ROI is nothing. It's nothing. It's all fake then. And then what you do is you come to church and everybody says, oh, we're so spiritual. Not spiritual. It's, a bunch of, it's all fake. It's all synthetic. The only way we can actually have fruit in our life other Christians and the fruit of the Spirit is for us as the branch to abide in the vine. If you want to be successful in your Christian life, it has to be done this way. It has to be done this way. William Scroge, he said this, the victorious life is one not of struggle, but of rest. It is an abiding I don't know how many of you feel at rest in your Christian life knowing that things are going to happen and it's going to happen organically, not synthetically, organically because of your abiding presence in God. You live your life that way and the amount of fruit, there'll be nothing that can compare to it. You don't have to do this on your own. You can't do it on your own. You know that? You can't do it on your own. You can't live a good Christian life on your own. You know something else you can't do? You can't save yourself. You can't be made righteous in the eyes of God by your own power, by your own strength. The Bible says that all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. It didn't say all of our wickedness said all of our righteousness, everything that we can do good is nothing but filthy, filthy rags before God. I want to show you this illustration. I want this hand to represent you and me, and I want this wallet to represent all of the bad things we've done, all of our sin. Here we are with all of our sin. And the Bible says that we all have sin. The Bible says for, for all have sinned. That's you and that's me. That's everyone in the world. Everyone in the world has sinned. All of us have done wrong. There, there are no exclusions. There is one exclusion, which is Jesus Christ, who is God, Son of God, God, in the flesh. But everybody in this room is a sinner. There is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. None of us are perfect. None of us. And the Bible says, here we are with our sin, and, and there's so many churches that say, well, if you just turn over a new leaf, they use the word repent, they say turn over a new leaf, you've got you to turn direct, you've you got you to turn away from your sin. You can't turn away from your sin. You can't turn away from your sin because you're a sinner. People say, well, if you get baptized or give money to the church or walk an aisle or pray a prayer, all these things. The Bible says that in order to go to heaven, you have to be perfect. People say, well, I ask them, I say, are you going to heaven when you die? They say, I'm a pretty good person. You say, well, being good is good, but being good isn't good enough to get to heaven. You've got to be perfect to go to heaven. Perfect. Now, how does that happen when you right here have all this sin on you? Well, this sin has to be paid for. And the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. That's what the Bible says. The wages of sin is death. That's the payment for sin. Somebody has to pay a death payment for this. Now, if you die with this sin, you will spend an eternity separated from God with your sin because you're paying for it. Okay? But I want this hand, and I mean it reverently, to represent the Lord Jesus. The Bible says, For he, God, hath made him Christ, who knew no sin, to be made sin for us. That we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. You see, the wages of sin is death. And so either we can spend an eternity trying to pay this payment of sin, or we can trust that Jesus, Christ, Jesus Christ's death on the cross 2,000 years ago was sufficient. It's His death on the cross that makes the payment because the wages of sin is death. And He didn't know any sin. He was perfect. He was sinless. Therefore, he's able to make the payment for our sin. Now that's amazing. And then we have his righteousness. He literally looks at you and me as righteous as he looks upon Christ. And he gives us something called eternal life. You know what eternal life is? That's forever. We believe that when you're saved, you're always saved. 
When Christ saves you, his payment was sufficient to pay it forever. People say, well, what if I sin tomorrow? And I say, well, did he pay for that sin or not? Was his sin payment, was his death payment enough to pay for all your sin? Or just the one you committed now and yesterday? No, tomorrow too. And I say, right. He died and he secures you with his blood. His payment on the cross was sufficient for all of our sins. We become a child of God. John chapter 1, for as many as receive him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. You believe in Christ alone as your Savior, you become a child of God. And he gives you eternal life. That's forever life, by the way. You can never lose that. That's awesome. So I sin tomorrow and I'm still a child? Sure. Just as much as my son who sins tomorrow is still my son. But what if, uh, what, if we, what if we turn our back on God and we say, God, I hate you and I don't want anything to do with you? Well, let me ask you a question. If my kids did that, are they still my children? Sure they are. But what if they went down to the courthouse and they tried to expunge me off the uh, birth certificate or whatever? You know, they say, I'm, no, I don't want you to be my dad anymore. Let me ask you something. You draw his blood, I guarantee you that he'll come back to me. Because he is my child. When we're saved, we're saved forever. And ever, amen. And that is amazing. That God would love us so much that he would secure us with a payment of blood. We have an awesome God, don't we? We have an awesome God. I love that song. Our God is an awesome God who reigns from heaven above. I won't sing anymore. I'll spare you. I'll spare you all. Friends, if you're here today and you don't know Christ as your personal Savior, you don't have to make him Lord of your life to be saved. You have to make him, all you have to do is trust him as your Savior. You don't have to promise to, to worship him. You don't have to promise to follow him. You trust him as your Savior. You trust him as your Savior. You believe he died for you. You believe he was buried. You rose again from the, he rose again from the grave. You are saved eternally. 